we meet up by the mailboxes out back um, at the Christian Education Building, right at, right at the mailboxes on the front part of that entr entrance, the one that's closest to the house and closest to the church. And that's our spot. See, in our house, one of the things that we do fairly regularly is that we have a fire safety plan. And I think all houses should have a plan, especially if you have kids. The idea is that in the event of a fire, you know exactly where it is you're supposed to go. So that if something happens in the house and everyone needs to evacuate the house, you have this one specific spot where you go and you congregate and you wait. And that is our spot. We chose that spot because it's giving us enough distance from the house and so we don't have to worry about if something were to go on. And, and part of what prompted this was our youngest was in class and they were doing uh, fire safety and fire truck stuff. So that's when we realized it was time to re-up our plan and go over it with the kids and have fire drills and all that stuff. And um, I don't like that we have a plan because if we have a plan, then that means we're kind of expecting something to go wrong, but I'm also simultaneously glad that we have the plan. Like, I don't think we're ever going to have to use it, um, but I've been wrong before. It's happened once or twice in my life. Um, so we could need it. So I'm glad that we have it. I mean, after all, what's the motto of the Boy Scouts? Be prepared. It's good to have a plan. It's good to be prepared to know what could happen so that we have a chance to deal with it. And I think that is one of the things that is core to human nature, is to we, it, we like to have as much control over everything that we can possibly control. We like to plan and make sure we know just about what is going to happen so we try to plan for everything that could happen. I am not proud to admit this, but I do have a plan in the back of my head for some reason in case there is a zombie outbreak that happens. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, maybe I watch too much TV, but it gets me thinking, okay, what would, ha what would we do in this situation? Now I know I will never need to use that, but I have it there just in case because that's what people do. It gives us a sense of calm in a chaotic world to try to have as many variables under our control as humanly possible. And we do this because the one thing we hate more than being uncomfortable is worrying about the future. Why do you think uh, there's always that section in the newspaper that has your horoscope that's just vague enough that you're like, oh, it gets me, it really gets me because it's so nice and vague. That's why it's always there. That's why when we prepare for a large family dinner, we have to know how many people are coming, and not only that, but we have to know people's allergies because someone might not be able to have gluten, someone might not be able to have uh, tree nuts or soy or any number of things, and we have to prepare the menu, but we have to do it in such a way where everybody can eat, not to mention the fact that we have to have enough plates and silverware and napkins and drinks on hand. It is hard work to prepare for a large family meal, but we don't want to be taken by surprise. That's why we have sign-up sheets. That's why we have RSVPs and things like that. And I can't help but wonder if this is one of the core things that makes us human, and I really do believe that it is. If that is the case, why then are we so unprepared for the second coming of Christ? 
It's like we don't even talk about it often in our churches, right? It's like, okay, we know that's a thing that's going to happen, but can we get back to nice, lovey-dovey, hippie Jesus who says love everybody so we don't have to worry about the scary part of the Bible with the dragons and things like that? Conversely, though, sometimes we talk about it too much and we focus too much on it and we think we crack the Bible code where we put all of these mismatched passages together and, and we say, okay, this is exactly when Jesus is going to come back. We know so we don't have to plan for anything beyond this date. And then when the date comes and passes, you're like, oh, no, I read something wrong. We're moving the date back and you keep moving the goalposts further and further. So what we have to do if we want to genuinely prepare for the second coming of Christ, which we should, we have to learn to live in this sort of anticipation. That we know it's coming, we just don't know when. And that is problematic for us. And the reason it's problematic for us is because we want to be prepared and we can't fully be prepared for this. But this is where I think our reading from 1 Thessalonians comes to give us some comfort. There's a lot of people that assume they can read the signs. You know, you have the, the four blood moons or whatever, you have this thing that happens, you have the Mayan calendar uh, that, you know, ran out and we assume maybe that was going to be the end of it all. And then they get wrong, and then they just have to change and revise and tweak things. And it's weird because this passage specifically says, you don't know when the end is coming. And Jesus specifically says, you don't know when the end is coming. Now, when I say the end is coming, I don't necessarily mean the end of all existence. I'm talking about what we call theologically the eschaton, the end times, when Jesus comes back to establish the heavenly kingdom on earth. That's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. It is an end times prayer that we pray on a weekly basis. That's the goal. That's what we expect to happen. And that kind of freaks us out if we're being honest. I can remember the first time I really heard about the end of the world. And it filled me with a sense of existential dread that I think was not needed for a middle school person. Because I thought to myself, someone said something about, oh, the end of the world, blah, 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 Jesus, and, and all this stuff. And I, think, I thought to myself, that sounds terrifying. Um, why would God allow this? I, was, I, I understand God is good. Um, I have some questions about the plan. And that's what happens when we don't do real good exegetical work in texts. We get confused and we get worried and we try to plan and scheme and, and think, okay, I'm going to be the master of my own destiny, but you can't be the master of your own destiny because you don't know when things are coming, and that's when the existential fear and dread kick in. But our text today combats that very nicely. Yes, it's going to happen. It's not necessarily going to be pretty. When we read about the day of the Lord, we know that it is kind of this sort of wonderful and terrifying moment in all of existence. And we know that it's coming. But we don't know when. But here's the hope. We know that it's coming. We just don't know when. Now, I know that that sounds weird to say, but it actually does give us hope because as the text points out, we're the children of light. We live in the daytime. And when you're in the daytime, when you're a child of light, when you have things illumined, you can see and understand the path ahead. That's why when you go camping, what's one of the things you always need to have? A flashlight. 
so you can see what's in front of you. And we know what's in front of us. We know that it is a reality that Christ will return to establish his heavenly kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, this wonderful moment where all of creation is simultaneously healed and made perfect as it was supposed to be in the beginning. And if G.I. Joe has taught us anything, it's that knowing is half the battle. We know so we can deal with it. And there's some wonderful things that happen in this text. You know, this is why you bear with one another. This is why you help one another. And it's kind and it's loving and it's really good. And it's a message of hope in the midst of something that, when misunderstood, can give us a sense of fear. But that's not what the coming of Christ is about. It's not about a sense of fear. It is about a sense of perfection and being close to God. We shouldn't be surprised when it happens because we know it's going to. If you can find me any time in the Bible where I don't know Jesus told a lie, where God told a lie, please point it out to me because I am literally staking my entire life on the fact and on the belief that Jesus Christ has never lied and will never lie, that God has never lied and will never lie. And if that is the case, and they said very clearly, lo, I am coming soon, I have to assume then that they are speaking the truth. Because Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So in the midst of not knowing what comes next, it brings me this sort of sense of eerie calm. Like I am expecting it. Like when I would upset my sister when we were children and she would say, I'm going to get you back. And usually that meant she was going to punch me in the arm. And she had a good punch, let me tell you. And I said, just do it and get it over with. And she would say something along the lines of, your punishment must be more severe. And not tell me when it was coming. So I lived in this anticipation of knowing it was coming, but not knowing when. And then all of a sudden, uh, days later sometimes, and it helped to know that it was coming, but it didn't really help. Because how do you prepare to get punched? And really, that's kind of the question we have. How do we properly prepare for the end? What are we supposed to do? And I think that's where our text from Matthew really gives us a sense of hope, but also a sense of purpose and direction. You see, this is a parable that Jesus is using and teaching to explain to the disciples what it exactly means when the Lord returns, because Jesus knows and understands that he will die, he will be resurrected, and he will ascend into heaven. Therefore, Christ has no heavenly body on, or, or no earthly body on earth, that Christ is physically in heaven, but the world is still a mess and the world keeps on spinning. And the one thing that the world is supposed to do is draw closer and closer to God. One of the great ends of the church, as written about in the PCUSA Constitution, is the exhibition of the kingdom of God to all peoples. That's one of the things we're supposed to do as the church. And Jesus did a really good job of that, but Jesus isn't here right now, but Jesus is here because we're here. Because Jesus says, I'm not leaving everybody in a lurch. No. See, God gives us talents, and I love the translation here of talents. I get that logically it's referring to money and things like that, but I don't think it's an accident that the word can be translated as talents, even though it is this sort of monetary thing, and this has a very financial feeling to it. 
But I love the fact that it's talents here, and there's a lot you can read into that. See, what happens is a master who has a land and wants it tilled, uh, he goes and he gives some of his servants, some of his slaves, talents. And he says, look after these while I'm gone and I'll be back. Doesn't tell him when he's coming back. Just says, look after these, um, I'll be back. And so one person gets five. And so he goes out and he invests in it and he doubles his investment. So instead of five now, he's got 10, which is double what he originally had. And the person who had two talents does something similar. I don't know how exactly they did it. I don't know if they bought, they traded, if they invested in banks and things like that. Doesn't matter. The point of the story is that they had a double investment. So instead of the master getting five talents or two talents, they're now receiving 10 talents or four talents. They're getting a return on their investment. But the one guy had one talent. And maybe he's thinking to himself, eh, it's one talent. There's not a lot I can do with that. And let me tell you, this is something that I struggle with as a parent on a daily basis. I live in constant fear of when the kids lose teeth. See, because when I was a kid, the tooth fairy gave me a quarter for each tooth. Do you know about inflation? I can't take, I can't give my kids a quarter. I can't drive them down to hills and have them put the quarter in the machine with the chicken while it clucks and spins and gives them an egg for a quarter. I can't do that. Most of the machines in stores nowadays don't even cost a quarter. They cost at least 50 cents. Because of inflation, the tooth fairy then has to increase their prices. And that is problematic for parents. Because you can't do a lot with a little. And that's what this guy thinks. I just got one talent. I can't do anything with it. Plus, I know the owner, I know the master, I know that they're a shrewd business person, I know that they, they gather where they didn't sow and, and where they didn't plant seeds, I know that they kind of do that. Now, theologically, what that means, that's the important part here, because it's not saying God is sneaky and underhanded. What it means is that God is able to go into the world, and even the people that don't know about God somehow are able to know about God and be harvested by God. How, though, is that the case? And the answer is... Because you have people doing the work. You have boots on the ground sharing the message of Jesus Christ. And so the master comes back. Guy with five says, hey, you gave me five. Guess what? Here's an extra five. Good job. Well done, good and faithful servant, the master says. Guy with two comes up. Yeah, okay, you only gave me two. Not complaining. I did my best to double the return. So here's an extra two for you. That is awesome, the master says. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then the last guy comes up. You gave me one. I was afraid and I didn't know what to do with it. So here's it back. And the master's like, no. Because if you know me and if you know that I like to have things... You should have done something with it. Why didn't you do something with it? And we never explicitly get that answer. But I am convinced that part of the reason that the man did nothing with the one talent is because you can't do much with a little. At least that's what we think. And the master says, guess what? You actually can do a lot with a little. You knew that I was coming back. You knew that I would want to return for my investment. And I gave you this thing and you did nothing with it. Why? You see, and that's the tension that we really live in our lives when it comes to the second coming. That's the part that we don't like to talk about when one day we will all stand before the throne and we will give an account of what we've done. And for some of us, that fills us with the existential fear and dread. 
but it shouldn't because we know it's going to happen. And we know that God has blessed us. The whole reason God blessed Abraham all those years ago was not just because Abraham was blessed and highly favored. It was that he was blessed to be a blessing. From those who have been given much, much more will be given to them. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. You have been blessed. You have talents. We collectively have talents. People wonder and cry out, where is God? Where is God? The kingdom of heaven is here now. It is a reality in our midst. Jesus may not be walking around currently, but we are. The church collectively is the body of Christ in the world, and we know the world is messed up. We know the world is headed in a bad direction. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we collectively going to do about it? Are we going to sit back and do nothing? Are we going to allow for a bad investment of what God has given us? Or are we going to put boots to the ground and get ourselves in gear and do that which God wants us to do, the exhibition of the kingdom of God to the world? The world needs Jesus. So let's give the world what it needs by doing that which God has called us to do. In doing so, we don't have to worry about when Jesus comes back. We don't have to be afraid because we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, and that gives us a sense of stability. It may be the end of the world as we know it when Jesus comes back, but y'all ain't got to worry because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that'll make you feel just fine. Amen.